Hi, thanks very much, Roxanne. Um, so I take it all of us are seasoned uh, veterans of EA, and so all of us know that the strongest arguments are based on um, nothing more than flimsy anecdotes, so I'd like to start with one of those at the beginning of the talk. <coughs> uh, on May 8th, 2018, New York State's highest court denied the Non-Human Rights Project leave for appeal, um, refusing to review an earlier decision made by a lower court that, that did not grant um, a writ, a writ of habeas corpus to two chimpanzees, Tommy and Kiko. <clears throat> this came following a five-year campaign uh, between the Non-Human Rights Project and each of New York's four intermediate appellate regional courts, um, in which these courts, too, uh, refused to grant um, a writ of habeas corpus relief to Tommy and Kiko, two chimpanzees, which released them from confinement and moved them into sanctuary. <clears throat> and so this um, means that Non-Human Rights Project needs to push their case again before the court, that Tommy and Kiko have to wait even longer to be moved from captivity into sanctuary, and moreover, that New York's case law remains unchanged. However, along with this decision <coughs> came an opinion from Judge Fahey, which um, was really quite striking in its content. Um, and the opinion stated that uh, <coughs> the decision not to grant leave to appeal to the Non-Human Rights Project was not based on the merits of the Non-Human Rights Project's claim. In fact, uh, moreover, um, he argued that the legal system really needs to grapple with questions of whether non-human animals can be granted uh, a fundamental right to liberty and be, can be granted a writ of habeas corpus for relief from confinement. Um, and more striking still, he argued that um, the, that the status of non-human animals as property under the law is a manifest injustice, and that while it may be arguable that chimpanzee is not a person, there's no doubt that it's not merely a thing. This came after an earlier decision um, in the intermediate appellate courts from Barbara Jaffe, uh, which was also striking in its content, arguing that um, whether one is a human is not relevant to whether one is a person under the law, and that ultimately questions about personhood will be decided by, not by, by facts about biology, but by facts about public policy and uh, principle. And so uh, what these opinions do is they create precedent within the court system and greatly increase the probability of the success of future personhood initiatives to grant fundamental legal rights for chimpanzees and other animals. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk about today is how we can evaluate the altruistic efficacy of campaigns such as these and how we can start to think about comparing them to um, other kinds of inter interventions we can perform that have caused more direct measurable change in the world, as well as other interventions which have a much more long-term systemic structural impact in the world, just like these kinds of campaigns. Um, there's a lot of um, inherent uncertainty when we're thinking about shaping the far future um, with structural um, distributed uh, interventions. And I think that there's room for a lot of reasonable disagreement about these issues, but that by thinking, reasoning qualitatively about some of the considerations that are in play, we can make progress in these issues and think about how to evaluate some of these kinds of interventions. So to do so, I will be um, reasoning qualitatively for the case for long-termism, the case from long-termism to moral circle expansion, and the case from moral circle expansion to personhood initiatives. So um, to get us started, I want to characterize what these personhood initiatives are. There are judicial and legislative initiatives aimed at establishing fundamental rights for non-human animals. And so they're concerned with rights law rather than welfare law. And the difference here is one of content. So welfare law concerns the treatment of non-human animals under conditions of, or of any individual, um, under conditions of domination and control. So the conditions of animals in laboratories and on farms, for example. Uh, whereas rights laws prohibit uh, domination and control in the first place, and they concern things like rights to bodily liberty, non-interference, mental and bo bodily integrity, and so on. Uh, and so I'll characterize personal initiatives as any of these initiatives that are trying to shape rights law um, through legal interventions and through legal means. Uh, the key players right now that are working on personal initiatives um, are, can be subdivided into two different kinds of um, approaches. Some go through the court systems, which are seeking to pursue uh, writs of habeas corpus, which release individual particular animals from situations of confinement um, and give, establish their fundamental rights. Um, and then legislative initiatives, which seek to uh, change the laws in a whole region for a whole group of animals um, directly. And so on the court side of things, um, Not Even Rights Project, who I mentioned at the beginning, is working in the US. In addition to the work that they've been doing for chimpanzees, they've also recently launched an initiative in Connecticut uh, trying, to stop, trying to gain a writ of habeas corpus for three elephants who are in a Connecticut zoo. The AFADA in Argentina um, recently, I believe in 2015, won a writ of habeas corpus for a, an orangutan, 
and later one Eurotopelius corpus for a chimpanzee. Um, <coughs> and the, and the, currently the state is trying to decide what the content of these rights will be, how to enforce them, and, uh, and so there's some, some uncertainty about how things will proceed, but it looks like very, a very promising move for these, at least these particular animals, if not for um, the majority of them within the country. And currently AFEDA is pursuing another writ for three chimpanzees who are in an eco park in Argentina. Uh, the Federation for Indian Animal Protection Organizations only recently started moving in on person initiatives in India, um, but they are uh, gearing up to pursue personhood for elephants and look to be using uh, litigation strategies as well. On the legislation side, uh, Sentience Politics, which is a spin-off organization from the original larger Sentience Politics working primarily on political campaigning um, in Switzerland, uh, is, pushing for, uh, is pushing for the fundamental rights to bodily liberty and mental integrity for chimpanzees in the state of Basel. And they're doing so through a citizen's initiative, so like a, a ballot initiative where citizens go and vote on um, an issue on the ballot to decide whether they want to establish, give these basic rights to um, chimpanzees throughout the state. So um, legislation, as I mentioned, directly shifts laws regarding particular groups of animals in partic particular districts, while litigation only concerns particular animals. Um, and so what litigation does is it sets precedent um, for further litigation and for legislation, and it also legit and it legitimates positive legislative ideals um, sort of blessing them before the law so that the law can um, take further steps and create further action um, on these rights. Um, and so what both of these strategies do in addition, in addition is they force the state to think more, less simpl simplistically and more complicatedly about rights law in general, clearing up confusion about what the purposes of rights are, what they're doing, how they protect individuals, um, that can pave the way for much more nuanced and expansive protection of the future that can cover a wide variety of sentient beings in a wide variety of circumstances. It allows the, the state to di digest the, um, these, some of these ideas, um, which, which will allow further progress in the future. And, um, yeah, I think that's it. For that. so, um, instead of evaluating whether, um, whether we should be pursuing litigation or legislation strategies, which animals we should be pursuing rights for, what countries we should be working in, and other important details that we, we can and should debate, I'd like to ask the question why we should be pursuing basically your rights for non-human animals in the first place um, in order to evaluate the efficacy of these kinds of strategies. And so to do so, um, I'm going to talk about, um, be using a paradigm called moral circle expansion. This is a specific kind of value spreading that includes any effort to shift the values and moral behavior of humanity and its descendants in a positive direction to benefit the far future. And this is motivated by uh, long-termism, which is a paradigm that has a lot of uptake in the effective altruism movement. It's the view that the primary determinant of the value of our actions we take today is the effect those actions have on the very long-term future. And I think that most people um, in this audience, most people in the world, when they reason on what they care about, um, are committed to some form of long-termism because the vast majority of beings who, who, um, who actions will affect are going to be in the future, and because future beings uh, have welfare that is no less important than present day beings. Um, if you don't think your values commit you to that, that'd be surprising. We can talk about that in the Q&A or talk in office hours, but I think that's, a, that's something that many of us are gonna find ourselves committed to. Um, and so moral circle expansion um, is an alternative but complementary strategy to AI alignment, which, um, which is often also motivated by long-termist considerations. I say it's complementary because in order to get the best outcomes that we want, we need to pursue both of these strategies. We need AI alignment to ensure that um, artificial intelligence has human values, but we need moral circle expansion to ensure that human values are good values that we actually want to see instantiated in an extremely powerful being who um, could greatly shape the, the trajectory of the future. Um, you might work on moral circle expansion if you think that the far future is not positive expectation for some reasons that I'm going to be discussing. Um, or if you think that, for reasons of tractability, you can do more, to, you or um, a particular group or all of us, could do more to improve the value of the far future by improving its expected quality rather than by extending its expected longevity. So many EAs who work on moral circle expansion are particularly concerned with um, risks of astronomical suffering or S risks. These are events that would bring about suffering on an astronomical scale, vastly exceeding all suffering that's ever existed on Earth so far. Um, these include possibilities such as the large number of sentient beings for recreation, a labor force, scientific experiments and prediction models, blackmail, revenge, justice, religion, and even pure sadism. Um, 
all the like nightmare scenarios that you can possibly cook up are, are thrown in here. Um, so um, many, but not all, asterisks are, um, are, have much higher probability if we have um, an artificial general intelligence that is uh, insufficiently aligned with values that would be ideal, the kinds of values we try to cultivate within the effective altruism movement. But again, not all of these um, outcomes are contingent upon um, any kind of AGI takeoff. Uh, some of them can exist without that. Um, on the topic of S risks, uh, Jonas Vollmer is going to be talking about um, S risks uh, in a meetup tomorrow uh, morning, I believe. So um, m for people who are interested in that, it would be a good place to learn more. Um, and so, so more people who are pursuing moral circle expansion uh, try to shape the far future to decrease the probability of these asterisks and extremely bad outcomes and increase the probability of very good outcomes by expanding the values that humans and future generations will have so that, such that they shape the world in positive rather than negative ways. And now I'd like to talk about how we can see rights legislation shaping um, our moral circle and our descendants' moral circles and the impact that rights have on the law has on morality. Uh, so rights legislation can perform three different functions. It can perform a deterrence function, it can set precedent, and it can also um, change values through a process that I'll call institutional signaling. And I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. Um, deterrence is the standard boring role that we see the law playing, um, or all of us believe the law uh, plays at least to some degree in some contexts, which is disincentivizing people from doing bad things by threatening them with punishment. And um, if, if the law plays its role, which it seems like it does in some extent, to some extent, this disincentivizes, um, this, if we have the right kinds of legislation, would disincentivize future people from harming sentient non-human beings. And while this is um, a boring, humdrum kind of role for the law to play, it is an important one, because if AI takeoff is sufficiently slow, there may be opportunities for sufficient, significant state regulation of AI. And if that's the case, and we have sufficient uh, moral circle expansion work, this could um, ensure that the kind of regulation that we have protects more sentient beings than just humans and more sentient beings than it otherwise would protect if we did not seek moral circle expansion. Um, of course, all other kinds of future actions which could, which could um, seemingly all uh, future actions which could cause um, risk of astronomical suffering too could be disincentivized through deterrence efforts. Um, now the law also um, Particular legislative acts in the law and particular legal interventions also set precedent. Um, in common law systems, like the United States, all published decisions and judicial opinions become part of the body of law that constrains the way that judges rule. And this is why the um, precedents or the opinions I discussed at the beginning of this talk were, are so important, because these two become part of the, um, the body of law um, and the body of decisions that constrains how judges can rule and shapes the kinds of decisions they can make in the future. And this is true even at the highest levels. So for, ex um, for example, in the US, the Supreme Court is um, significant, their decisions are significantly shaped by precedent as well. Um, the Supreme Court decides which cases they're going to hear and will not hear cases where they think that um, there's been a sufficiently good ruling on them already. They won't um, pick up the cases, dive into them, analyze them, discuss them amongst themselves. And so, uh, and so legal precedent can shape what the Supreme Court hears and does. But it can also make certain laws immutable with increasing time, institutional reliance, and political acceptance. Some laws just become too deeply ingrained um, to be very easy to do something about through precedent setting. Um, and of course, the decisions that of courts and other branches significantly shape each other's agenda. What one branch does can, make, can change what's actionable for another branch and can change what's relevant for another branch. Um, in fact, uh, decisions, uh, in fact, when courts, um, uh, decide in favor of uh, ascribing certain rights to individuals, such as in the case of um, Sandra, the uh, orangutan in, in Argentina, oftentimes what the court system will do is they'll hand off the legislation to, the, to another government agency who will decide um, how, like what content this law should have and how they should employ it. And so this can, then can change um, uh, the legislature's priorities as they think about what the structure of these rights should be. And it can also produce positive legal content for the legislatures to use in their legislation. Um, and so in all these cases, th wh whether we're using uh, legislative actions or lit litigatory actions, um, decisions that courts and other branches make will set precedent for future decisions and allow us to have better, more progressive, more effective laws in the future. 
Um, finally, and I think most importantly for our purposes, the law plays, um, can provide institutional signaling that can greatly shape human moral attitudes and behavior. I think that uh, questions about institutional signaling are best framed by a question. Uh, the question is whether common sense morality is better than it once was because the law has changed, or whether the law has changed because common sense morality is better. Do people discriminate less today because discrimination is legally prohibited, or does the law prohibit discrimination because um, we, are, we discriminate less and our values have gotten better? Um, so I think obviously this, the question as posed is not a good one. Uh, we would expect the direction, the um, the relationship between the law and morality to be bi-directional. Morality influences the law and law influences morality. Um, but I'm gonna be arguing, uh, giving some reasons to favor the latter thesis to think that the law can significantly change people's morality. So one way in which the law can shape human morality and moral behavior is by being a persuasive source for morality for people with uptake. So because society is diverse and different people are offering you different moral judgments all the time, your peers, your parents, your um, faith communities, and um, political parties and everyone around you seems to disagree about morality, um, the law may be a particularly pr powerful source for shaping and sustaining moral norms, since law is a common denominator that holds across all citizens, um, unless a particular uh, issue is, is very divisive and contentious in the law. Um, but to the degree that it is a common denominator among citizens, the law may be a very powerful source for shaping morality. Um, and if, if this thesis is right, then the informational influence of the law is likely to be a heuristic process um, affecting our system to reasoning such that the informational content of the law is invoked in our intuitive common sense moral judgments that we make in everyday cases. Now, I think this um, view is plausible in reflection, but not a lot of research has been done to understand it and see whether this is actually a way that morality is shaped. Um, the evidence is pretty thin. The two best known empirical studies, um, which are studies in which people were um, asked to judge the morality of a bunch of uh, unsavory behaviors, uh, are highly inclusive. And in these cases, what, what the study participants were asked is whether these behaviors were right and wrong, and then they were told that the action was either legal or illegal. And there was some change in people's uh, perceptions of the morality of these actions based on whether they were legal or illegal. Um, they were more likely to describe them as immoral if they were illegal, as, as one would expect. Um, but as Nigel Walker, one of the study authors himself, has pointed out, um, a lot of this data might be explained in terms of the fact that there were some conscientious law-abiding citizens in the room who thought that some actions that are illegal can be wrong in virtue of the fact, in virtue of the fact that they're illegal. And so when they're told they're illegal, they then become morally wrong because breaking the law is morally wrong on, on the views of some of these conscientious law-abiders. Uh, um, law um, so this doesn't provide a lot, we don't have a lot of evidence for the persuasive source of morality view of the law, but um, these particular studies and a bunch of other studies also do show a much stronger effect of perceived pure opinion on morality. So one thing that these studies did show was that when they, um, in a separate uh, variable condition, when participants were told that their peers strongly favored a certain, um, strongly believed that certain actions were moral or immoral, this greatly updated people's perceptions of the morality of these actions. And so I think that the law can play a very effective role in shaping moral attitudes and behavior by representing group attitudes as being a particular way. Because social norms strongly anchor human moral attitudes and behavior, um, the law can shape morality by shaping what's perceived as the group norms and attitudes. And this can happen directly when group members infer that a certain level of momentum must exist in order to support the change um, that has happened. Um, we can see this in two separate studies that Tankard and Pollock uh, recently performed um, on Supreme Court rulings on gay marriage. Here they found robust evidence that the Supreme Court ruling uh, legalizing gay marriage was associated with significant shift in perceived present and future social norms in support of gay marriage. Uh, so these two studies, um, the first study was, let's see. So the, the second study was a study in which they performed five separate MTurk studies. And um, the, the first three MTurk studies happened before the Supreme Court ruling in favor of gay marriage. And the, la and the last two MTurk studies happened after it. And they found that study participants who, uh, study participants evaluating the morality of, um, of gay marriage and evaluating the positivity of gay rights uh, um, updated strongly on pure opinion after the Supreme Court ruling on gay marriage. They strongly uh, imp improved their belief that 
the public supported gay marriage and was moving in a direction that was more supportive of gay marriage. Um, a different study was uh, performed a different, um, used a different technique, and what they did was they gave sort of fake articles to study participants that were either predicting a really strong landslide win in favor of gay marriage or one really strongly against gay marriage, and evaluated um, candidates' attitudes uh, towards gay marriage and gay rights in this context. And this one found that people who were given a positive ruling in these articles um, not only perceived a much greater status quo norm in favor of gay rights and much stronger directional norms in favor of it, but their personal attitudes towards gay marriage were also much more positive, and their feelings towards gay people on a feeling thermometer were also much more positive. Um, and, this, and so this study su strongly suggests not only that this can shape, um, not only that the law can shape what's perceived as, um, pure, as pure opinion and group norms, but also people's own um, moral attitudes. Flores and Barclay similarly found a massive increase in pro-gay rights attitudes immediately following an earlier Supreme Court ruling, um, which, in, which importantly didn't uh, result in, didn't have any backlash either. And I won't go through this study very much, but you can see looking at the um, transitional probabilities that, that in states where there were, um, that in a number of states, there were very, very large updates from people who opposed gay rights to, be, to, pe to becoming ambivalent about gay rights. In some states, 24% of people who opposed became ambivalent, and in some, 47% who opposed became ambivalent. And there was also a minority of participants who updated in favor um, from being ambivalent about gay rights to favoring them um, as well. And, and so here we see just a, a really massive transition in pro-rights attitudes following a Supreme Court ruling that legalized gay marriage in some states and increased um, protections for people in gay partnerships. So the law can also represent group attitudes more indirectly. When people change their, opinion, change their behavior to accord with law, um, their cognitive processes are opaque. People don't know why they're acting this way, um, but, but they assume automatically that the reason people are acting this way is because they want to, because that's what good people, responsible people do. And so when people start, you know, discriminate less or they eat uh, less meat or um, <coughs> perform any behavior that may become, uh, that may become disincentivized by the law, or incentivized by the law rather, people assume that they're doing that because they want to and that's what good people do. And over time people begin to see a world free of certain behaviors as normative, not because the law says so, but because others are doing that. Um, I won't go through all of these conditions under which norms and behavior shifting seem to be more powerful. But some of these, I think, are particularly important for purposes here. Um, so the law can be more influential um, on norms and behavior when, uh, number three, individuals' personal views are closer to the new normative information, which I think points positively in favor of a goalpost shifting strategy, which starts with uh, more low-hanging legal fruit. And when we, when we update society's morality in a direction that's favorable to the rights of non-human animals, we can then pursue increasingly more progressive legal initiatives taking people's personal views even cl cl um, iterated closer and closer to um, the more progressive legal wins. Four, when new normative information is widely shared, which I think suggests the importance of uh, mass media mobilization surrounding uh, legal campaigns. And six, when political movements coexist to mobilize individuals following decision, which I think suggests the importance of um, large amounts of grassroots mobilization around uh, legal initiatives. Um, and so all of this suggests that, the pr that uh, we should be pluralistic in our approach to advocacy, employing legal interventions alongside grassroots and mass media mobilization. And through a combination of precedent setting and norm and attitude change, iterated personal initiatives and other legal interventions can progressively shape the law and moral attitudes, establishing increasingly progressive basic rights for sentient beings. And we can expect this in turn for the reasons I've discussed to increasingly expand humanity's moral circle. Um, so I've got some conclusions here, but I've already run over by a little bit, so I think I'll just start to move towards Q&A and, and let you read the conclusions by your own. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. All right, yeah, you want to yes, join yes, me over here? Yes, Great. Thanks again for your talk. Really appreciated it. Um, have a couple of somewhat challenging audience questions. Um, <laughs> we'll you. see if, if they get a little if they get a little too complex. I think you can just speak to him in office. Can hours. I like delegate? Um, yeah, that's right. Just call on call on the audience okay. for these. Um, the first one was: uh, Do you think that these initiatives? I think the initiatives at the beginning of your talk uh, work in concert with incrementalist legal approaches like the current California ballot initiative, which maybe mm -hmm. you know about, mm -hmm. um, or should they be prioritized above other laws? Uh, right. So I think that um, 
So I think that's not a, a, a binary sort of question. I mean, so I think th my suspicion is that they do work in concert. Um, welfare laws do increase people's moral sentiments towards non-human animals and create momentum for further legal wins. And I think there's increasing consensus in the effective animal advocacy movement that that is indeed the case. And for that, for that reason, we can expect these to um, increase the likelihood of success of establishing basic legal rights for non-human animals. Um, so I think they do work in concert. There's still a question of which of these strategies should we be prioritizing more heavily. Um, and that's a question that I feel ill-equipped to answer. Um, but, uh, but we should be prioritizing both of them much more heavily than we currently are. Cool. Um, someone else asked, uh, are there risks with personhood being legally expanded to include animals if there are times when significant welfare improvements for animals would come into conflict with those laws? I was pressed to find an example of, of when this might be the case. Maybe yeah. the audience member could elaborate on what an example of this might be. So le legislating basic rights for non-human animals would come in conflict with welfare laws yeah. protecting non-human animals. Um, yeah, I don't have a really good sense of what that would look like. Um, uh, I have a, there's, there's some hands that are suggesting I this. Person, but here's one. Yeah. Say if the Okay, <laughs> I thought you were going in a different direction from this, which might be, so here, I mean, here's another similar line of thought, which is like, so a lot of these basic legal protections are in favor of things like autonomy and bodily liberty. Um, if we give a large amount of autonomy and bodily liberty to non-human animals, we leave them to their, much to their own devices to make their own decisions. Um, it gives us fewer uh, grounds for paternalism uh, in supporting their welfare against their own preferences. Um, and so, and so li like liberal rights could also come into conflict with welfare in that, in that way as well. Um, and I think this is, and I think if this is the kind of uh, idea we have here, we do need to balance um, the autonomy we give for, for indirect um, moral circle expansion kinds of reasons and the, welfare, the direct welfare benefits um, of paternalistic interventions. And I think this is a question just to be worked out in the, in the decision about what kinds of laws we codify and how much paternalism we allow um, given the basic rights that we ascribe to non-human animals. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're pretty close on time, so I think I'm going to have to call the questions there. But thanks again so much. Thank you.